Um, yet another standard model. This time it's the standard model of cosmology. As you will see, it's conceptually and mathematically much easier than what Christoph just presented you in his beautiful lecture on the, on the standard model of particle physics. Um, the, the main goals that I wanted to pursue with these lectures during this week uh, are that, first of all, um, I would like you to understand what the cosmological standard model is, is founded upon. Um, second, I would like to present to you uh, the empirical evidence that uh, supports the cosmological standard model and that leads to the to the convincing power of the cosmological standard model despite its uh, apparently awkward conclusions so that will be a main part of of the lectures and then of course if you combine the two if you if you see what the cosmological standard model is based upon and what the empirical evidence is um, you might see a way how to how to move on in cosmology and right? what you would need to change in order to possibly arrive at, at different solutions right? so as you will see uh, i'm not at all claiming that this is the final model for cosmology right? something must be something is probably badly wrong right but uh, what i would like you to understand during this week um, is also that um, the niche into which you would have to move in order to change things is actually apparently very narrow. All right, so let's begin. Here's the menu. Uh, number one, geometry and dynamics. Uh, can you read this? <laughs> okay, uh, geometry and dynamics. So we have to speak about the model of space-time that underlies the, um, the cosmological standard model. We will have to speak about the parameters that quantify it because of course first of all their measurement um, and second their values um, will will be important during uh, during the lectures about the age of the universe and its distances and the distances I'm using the plural intentionally right, the distances the different distance measures um, that occur in in cosmology then we will have to move into the early universe by speaking about the thermal evolution of the universe and primordial nucleosynthesis. And as you will see, this opens already one path um, into possibly alternative, um, uh, in possible alternatives to the cosmological standard model, which may or may not become important. Um, then we will have to speak about recombination nucleosynthesis, right, the um the theory of of how the first elements formed in the universe and how the universe uh became transparent both events um need to be understood very well for us to uh, draw conclusions on um uh, from from cosmological data then we will so up to up to this point right up in and, and including number four we will speak about the unperturbed the homogeneous universe right it this is the, the simplest uh, approach that we can take to uh, cosmology. Then from here on we will include perturbations and we will include structures, uh, the origin and the evolution of structures in the universe. So we'll first speak about the growth of perturbations, about statistics and nonlinear evolution and that's the, um, that mainly concerns the late time evolution of uh, cosmological structures. Then we will move back uh, to the rather early universe. Uh, it's not grown up yet, but adult. Um, by speaking about the structures that we see in the cosmic microwave background. And, and then we will go to um, cosmological weak gravitational lensing as one way of quantifying the late evolution of structures in the universe about type 1a supernovae as one way of measuring the expansion history of the universe. And then finally we'll conclude with cosmological inflation and dark energy. That's the program. Uh, may look large, but nonetheless we have four lectures, so uh, we will do. So, number one, it's about geometry and dynamics. Now, first of course, we will have to speak about the assumptions that go into the cosmological standard model and their justification, um, but also, of course, about the, the theoretical foundation of the cosmological standard model, and that's the, the point of the, of, the, of the first chapter here. Um, we'll introduce the metric space-time, 
uh, or rather the choice for the metric that we are going to make. We'll speak about redshift dynamics and finally uh, end this lecture with a remark on Newtonian dynamics. And uh, perhaps it's needless to say, but if you find anything unclear, just ask, <laughs> shout, interrupt. <coughs> okay, so what are the main assumptions? Well, the first assumption is that um, the observable properties of the universe are isotropic. Um, this may sound odd to begin with, right? because if you think of observing the night sky, then you immediately may have the impression that the sky is everything but not isotropic. So what is meant by that? What is meant by that is that if you observe physical quantities of the universe, for example, radiation densities, densities of sources that you may see in the universe, um, fluctuation amplitudes that you may observe, and physical properties of that sort, then if you average these properties over sufficiently large volumes within the universe, um, then those averaged properties appear direction independent as seen from our point in space. Now this again raises, raises additional questions. The first is, can we average over scales which are first of all sufficiently large so that we can average local fluctuations out and still sufficiently small compared to the overall size of the universe. In other words, is it possible in the first place to separate scales in the universe in such a way that we can in fact meaningfully speak about such an, an averaging process? And in fact we can, because we know from observations that the structures, the fluctuations that we see, have typical scales on the order of 10 megaparsecs. If you don't know what a megaparsec is, it's 3.1 times 10 to the 24 centimeters. Right? Not in natural <laughs> units. Okay. Um, so first of all, yes, it is possible to separate scales in that way. But, um, as you will see, there is a rest frame, a preferred frame of reference in the universe, with respect to which the universe is in fact remarkably isotropic, as proven by observations. But then of course if you have one rest frame in which the universe appears isotropic, then any rest frame that moves with uh, sorry, any frame that moves with respect to that rest frame will not see an isotropic universe anymore. Right? So the uh, the uh, the first statement here is not at all trivial because it means that of course not every observer will see an isotropic universe, but that there exists a set of observers for whom the universe appears isotropic. Okay, so in fact this is a delicate statement and as we, as we move to uh, the foundations of the cosmological standard model, uh, we will have to, to make this statement even more precise. What I will have to show you afterwards is um, empirical evidence for the claim that the universe may in fact be isotropic, right? if observed from the right point of view, <laughs> if observed from the right uh, frame of reference. All right, the second statement <coughs> says that our position in the universe is not at all preferred to any other. In other words, um, we are in no way preferred if you move to some other place in the universe, no matter how you would do that, um, you would still see uh, an, on average, isotropic universe. This statement essentially cannot be tested. Right? The first one can. For the first one we have to compile sufficient evidence um, that shows us that our sky, if appropriately averaged, can in fact be described as isotropic. Right, so the first statement is in fact empirically testable, the second essentially is not. Right, and this is, this is already um, an important statement if you wanted to aim at a different, a different cosmological model. Okay. So this is called the cosmological principle, sometimes also called the Copernican principle, because of course it, it lifts the uh, Copernican assumption, not we are in the middle of the universe, but the Sun is, right, to the next higher level not the sun, no, our sun is the middle of the universe, but somebody else, 
or maybe nobody. Okay. Now, with these two assumptions, uh, we have to construct uh, a physical world model. Now, how do we do that? Right? What theory are we going to base the cosmological model upon? So clearly, of the four interactions that we know in physics, um, three are completely irrelevant for cosmology. Right? For the um, weak and the strong interaction, that's obvious because of their finite reach. Right? For the electromagnetic interaction, uh, it is not in the first place obvious because the electromagnetic interaction has infinite reach. However, because there are two different types of charge, electromagnetic interaction can be shielded. Nonetheless, we know that there are magnetic fields in the universe which have enormous coherence lengths. Right? For example, in the, in the coma cluster of galaxies, where we see that the coma cluster of galaxies is embedded into a magnetic field, um, which extends over tens of megaparsecs, right? with huge scales. Nonetheless, we believe that the energy density which is stored in these coherent large cosmological magnetic fields is so low that they do not play any significant cosmological role. Right? This is not just a belief. We can measure uh, the strength of these magnetic fields. We find that they are typically on the order of um, 0.1 gauss, sorry, 0.1 microgauss or less than that, which means that their energy, is in energy density is in fact uh, much lower than uh, the energy densities that do play a role in cosmological, in cosmological physics. All right, so one interaction is left, it's gravity. The best theory we have for gravity is general relativity. So we need to find um, a solution of the field equations of general relativity, Einstein's field equations, in order to construct the cosmological standard model or a cosmological model, um, which corresponds to these two assumptions that uh, we would like to make. All right, now how does this work? How does this work? Well, before we go into that, let's maybe have a look at a picture. Is it too bright? Or t uh, can, you, can you see this well? All fine? Um, this is our local universe. All right. So you will see many of these eggs as the lecture proceeds. They show you projections of the fo wonderful. Thanks. They show you projections of the. Are you going to fall asleep if I switch that off? <laughs> hmm. Which could it be? <laughs> All right. If more than a third of you are falling asleep, I will stop the lecture. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. So these are projections of the full sky onto the plane in whatever projection in this case in this, this case is a so-called Mollweide projection and the uh, the projection is oriented such that the the plane of our Milky Way galaxy falls into the equatorial plane of the map right, so what you what you see here is a in the in the center the center plane um, of the map the Milky Way galaxy itself usually you do not see into the center of the Milky Way if you use optical light. Right? So if you use an optical telescope, um, you see the center of the Milky Way hidden because there's a lot of dust. And a lot of dust that absorbs the light from um, the center of the Milky Way. However, this picture is taken in the infrared at two micron, two micrometer wavelengths. And so you can see right through the dust because in the, in the infrared, the dust is transparent. All right, what you see around the galaxy the galaxy with a capital G, right, the Milky Way galaxy, um, is the local environment that the Milky Way is embedded into. Right? So each of the colored dots is a galaxy, and you see that, of course, we are surrounded by very pronounced structures. Right? They will later on give us a lot of headache, uh, but for the moment, I would like to uh, describe with this picture how structured and how anisotropic, in fact, our local universe is. All right, under these conditions, right, and looking at this map, you can imagine that you can average over spots on, the, on this map. Um, and if these, if these spots are large enough, um, then you can imagine that you can isotropize this map. 
Right? So this is also meant to illustrate the scale separation I have mentioned before. Right? The structures are on, on scales that are comparatively small uh, compared to the large scale structures that you see on these maps. Now if you jump very far ahead, this is something that, that the lecture of course will have to describe, but this is a map of the temperature fluctuations of the heat radiation left from the origin of the universe, the Big Bang, right, which uh, was released when the universe was um, just close to 400,000 years old. Mm, the color scale shows you the temperature, the scale of the temperature fluctuations. Yeah. Density of galaxies. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, so the more yellow it gets, the more dense are the galaxies. <coughs> All right, so here the color scale is the temperature fluctuation, uh, but the temperature fluctuation goes from minus 10 to the minus 5 to plus 10 to the minus 5 relative to the mean. Right, so what you see here is um, actually a very clear demonstration how isotropic the universe does in fact get if you, if you look over very long distances through the universe. Okay. So this is one reason why we believe that in fact the assumption of isotropy as seen from our position is not too bad. Right. Even, though, even though this does not look isotropic at all. Okay. All right, now what do we do? Uh, the central object of general relativity is the metric tensor. Right? The, the uh, this describes the geometry of space-time. Now, in general relativity, we have to replace the Minkowskian metric of special relativity by a dynamical field. Right? So, T mu nu, the metric tensor is going to change um, with space, with spatial coordinates and in time. But here the first problem arises. Right? In general relativity, in the first place, you do not know what the time direction is. Right? You start out with uh, a space-time, in which you will first have to identify the time direction. Right? Only once you can identify a time direction, you will know what three space is. Right? You will know what, what in, in what way you can split your space-time into a time direction and perpendicular spatial hypersurfaces. But only once you know what spatial hypersurfaces are, you can meaningfully speak about isotropy. Right? Because the isotropy is an isotropy in space. So first of all, uh, we have to identify a time direction. And one of the fundamental statements of the, uh, of the cosmological standard model is that there is, in fact, a global time direction throughout the universe. This is completely unfamiliar in, in other applications of general relativity. Right? In other applications of general relativity, the time direction will change as you move through space. In cosmology, it doesn't. Right? This has a very important consequence later on. All right, so the first thing is we assume that there is a global time direction. If we can assume that there is a global time direction, we know how to foliate right, space-time into three-dimensional hypersurfaces, one for each moment in time. Only once we have done that, we know what isotropy is. Right? Isotropy means that uh, if I rotate in the so-defined spatial hypersurfaces <coughs> with SO3, right? in other words, if I apply SO3 to the spatial part of the metric, then this is invariant. Okay, but notice the definition of a global time direction comes first. Right? Only then we know what we are doing. All right, um, but then remember what I said about the about the preferred frame in cosmology. Right? Again, if one observer sees a global direction of uh, of time which doesn't change. This does by no means mean that all observers see this. Right? It only means that there is a preferred class of observers, the so-called fundamental field of observers. These are the freely falling observers in that space-time, um, which can define a global time coordinate. And only for those observers it then makes sense to speak about isotropy. We are not freely falling observers in the universe. We can prove that. I will show you evidence later. However, we see 
from measurable signals how we, how we should transform our frame of reference such that the frame into that we would then move would in fact see an isotropic universe. Okay? So what this means is that the metric that as I'm as I'm going to describe it now will be the metric as measured by one of those fundamental observers, right? One of the freely falling observers. And it doesn't make sense to speak uh, uh, about isotropy for everybody else. Right? Now you might say, well this is breaking Lorentz invariance. Yes of course. Right? But there's no problem with that because we are talking about a single realization uh, of our universe. Right? Not the theory breaks Lorentz invariance, but our realization. Well, yes. <coughs> <coughs> All right. So under these conditions, right, we can take this 10 component, sorry, s we start with 16 components of the metric tensor, of course, right, 4 by 4. But since it's symmetric, it has only 10. Um, uh, 10 independent components, and then we do the following construction. Right, we transfer into the rest frame of the freely falling observers. Then we know that isotropy requires that there cannot be any time, space, components in the metric. So the space-time components of the metric would be those with indices 0i, where 0 well, this is the, the time direction, i are the spatial directions, because if we could not transform these g0i's away, they would define a preferred direction, which is of course not compatible with isotropy. Right, so isotropy requires the possibility that in the rest frame of the fundamental observers, these elements of the metric just do not occur. And then of course, um, the spatial, the purely spatial metric, must be compatible uh, with the rotations. Right? In other words, it must be invariant under rotations. In other words, it must describe a three uh, uh, spherically symmetric three space. All right, and then <coughs> one, one, one second. <laughs> Coming back to that, uh, and then we finally have to say what is G zero zero, and that is simple. We just set this by requirement that a freely falling observer with his or her watch would measure the cosmological time. And this amounts to setting G00 to 1. Yeah? So uh, I don't understand that when you say that it's okay to break Lorentz invariance Yeah. Well, the theory remains Lorentz invariant. Uh, but the specific model we are making can break Lorentz invariance without any problem, right? Because it's one realization of the uh, of the solutions of the theory. Okay, so you, you can take a specific way to your physics. Exactly. And it's just a nice to do physics. Exactly. Yeah. Did you hear the question? The question was, mm, what is this about breaking Lorentz invariance? Right? Can we really do this? And my answer is yes, we can because we are fixing a frame. Um, for a preferred treatment uh, of cosmology, okay. So it's not the theory that becomes uh, that that breaks Lorentz invariance, but it's our choice of the fra of the frame that breaks Lorentz invariance. All right. Given that. Wait, sorry. If we have ah. matter content, why should we have Lorentz invariance in the first place? We have an, ener an energy density. Well, you would you would describe the the matter content also with a Lorentz invariant Lagrangian, right? So in that sense, the theory remains Lorentz invariant even if you had matter, right? But then you choose a, spe uh, a specific frame of reference, okay. right? and it's it's that frame that is singled out by the free fall move of the fundamental observers through that space time. All right. So this is now this is now a different version of what we said, right? For a freely falling observer, we just fix the uh, the metric element C00 such that clocks are being synchronized, and then um, the line element of the metric looks like this, or can be written like that. So, what does it mean? Well, first of all, we have the um, the time time part which we just discussed and which we set by synchronization of clocks. Then we have the space-space part, and right? it's this metric. 
So you have a, dis a radial distance. And then you have um, a solid angle element. However, now it's not at all clear that the area of a sphere should scale like radius squared. This is what we know from Euclidean from from the uh, Euclidean space. Right? In Euclidean space, you would just write. If W is the radius, or DW is the radial element, you would just write W squared, the omega square. Hmm. However, in a, uh, even though we have now foliated our space-time into spherical sections, which must be isotropic, we can still allow these, uh, these three spaces to be curved. But if we curve them, right, the relation between um, the radial coordinate and the area of spheres you define in that three space does not have to be the same as in Euclidean space. Right, let me let me throw a simple example. Uh, suppose this perfect circle is the Earth, right, and here's the North Pole. Thank you. And here are the meridional lines. Now you draw a circle at a fixed distance from the North Pole. Of course, the circumference of this circle is not just two pi, uh, not just two pi r, if r is this is this difference here. Right? You can see this very clearly if you move this circle down to the South Pole, where its circumference is obviously zero. But its radius is much larger than that, right? It's the whole the whole length of the meridional lines. In other words, in curved space, uh, it's not at all clear that this radial distance here should just be the radius. Okay, so we need a, a, a radial coordinate or radial uh, uh, a definition of the radius, which allows for curvature effects. Right? And this is why we need to introduce this function fk of w here. If space is flat, curvature is zero, then of course the radial coordinate equals the radius. Uh, if space is positively curved, k larger than zero, then the, the radial, the radius here, is the sine of the uh, of the radial coordinate. This is the same thing as on the Earth, right? If you if you make the same construction here that I just described on the Earth here, then the circumference of this circle would behave as you go from the North Pole to the South Pole, as the sign does with the radius along the meridional line, right? It becomes maximal at the equator and shrinks to zero um, at the South Pole. Right? That's exactly the same thing. And if the if the curvature is negative, then the radius um, switches from the sine to the hyperbolic sine. Right? Then the circumference of um, of circles would grow exponentially as you move away uh, from the center point. All right. So, this is the spatial metric now, but allowing for curvature, allowing for spatial curvature. Yeah. Could you explain again why isotropy in higher g0i to be zero? Yeah. It's all the same for every i, then even if it's non zero, I think it's isotropy. Well, if you could define a non zero g0i, uh, if you could define non zero g0i elements, and you could not introduce a frame of reference that would make those components of the metric disappear, then there would be an irreducible vectorial direction, right, as identified by the G0Is. And this must not be because of isotropy. Right? I isotropy tells you that you must be able to rotate your space-time in such a way 
that spatial hypersurfaces remain invariant. G0 1 is equal to G0 2 and G0 3? Well then it would just mean you have a diagonal vector, but you still have defined a vector in your space-time. Okay? And this vector would define a preferred direction. And this must not be, because it's, it's incompatible with isotropy. Okay? All right, so this defines the metric of space of the spatial hypersurfaces, whether they be curved or not. Right? And now you have a single, a single degree of freedom left in your metric, and this is that you can stretch or shrink the spatial hypersurfaces homogeneously as a function of time. In other words, you can scale the spatial metric by a function which, of course, must only depend on time. Right? Because if it depended on the spatial coordinates as well, then you would break homogeneity, which is not allowed by the assumptions. So this function A of t is now your only remaining degree of freedom. And of course, um, homogeneity requires that this curvature parameter here be the same everywhere. Right? So that's a global parameter on the spatial hypersurfaces. So that's all, right? This is what we can define. Now, curvature can be positive, zero or negative, as I said, right? Which gives rise to hyperbolic, Euclidean, or spherical geometry. So you could ask what values can k take, right? The parameter k that describes the curvature of the hypersurfaces. Well, you can scale coordinates such that it can only be minus one, zero, or plus one. Right, the absolute meaning of k, or the, the absolute value of the curvature parameter k is irrelevant because by changing your length, your, your unit of length, you can change the curvature parameter as well. Okay? So k can be minus one, zero, or, or plus one. And we have now very strong observational evidence that k is in fact zero. Right? In other words, that our spatial hypersurfaces are in fact Euclidean. But to begin with, we need to allow the possibility that space may be curved. Notice there's a difference between spatial curvature and space-time curvature. Okay. The parameter k here means spatial curvature. Right? The geometrical curvature of the three spaces perpendicular to the preferred cosmological time direction. This does by no means imply that space-time could not be curved. What's the difference? Suppose you take a big rubber sheet and you print a coordinate grid on it. Okay. Now how do we do this? <laughs> let's, suppose it's, let's suppose it's circular and sufficiently many of you stand around this, this circular rubber sheet and start pulling, of course all with the same force, um, the rim of that of that rubber sheet outward. At the same time you lift it upwards, right, so that as a function of time the rubber sheet would be lifted over the table. At the same time would be stretched. Now think about the trajectory of one of the coordinate points on the rubber sheet. Right? We have printed a coordinate grid on that. Identify one of the grid points and see how it moves. If that moves along a straight line, then first of all space is flat and space-time also is. But if these coordinate lines move on curved lines, then space-time is curved even though space is flat. Okay? And again, we need this later, right? Because we know that our universe, we know that empirically, that our universe is spatially flat. At the same time, we know very well and we can measure that, and this has important consequences, that it's not flat in space-time. Right? It's curved in space-time. All right. What else? Uh, this is the light cone of special relativity. Right? You know that very well. It's just the, the geometrical illustration of what the Minkowski metric means. Here's space. Here's time. Here are V. So mine just shrink, uh, shrinks to a point right, on this diagram. 
All right, this is our position in space-time today. Now, of course, this is our forward light cone. So, in other words, this is the collection of points in space-time that we can reach by light signals. At the same time, this is the backward light cone, or past light cone, or past null cone, or whatever it's being called. Um, that is the collection of space-time points that can influence us by light rays. Now, suppose you would carry this light cone into a space-time which expands over time. What would it look like? It would look like this. If it expands, well, this is just the backward light cone now. Um, if the space-time expands, then this means that as you go back in time, it shrinks. So in other words, this backward light cone here would be pulled together as we move back in time. Okay, this geometrical figure, which you could call a backward light pair or backward light bulb or whatever, right? This collects all points in our cosmological space-time that we can receive information from. This is our visible universe. Okay, that's very important to realize. Everything that we can observe in our universe with light must have uh, must have gone through this backward light cone at one instance of time in the past. Okay, this is our observable universe. There's no more for us to see. So this also tells you that it's completely meaningless to ask how large is the universe. Right? All you can ask is how large is the volume uh, included in our backward light cone. That is a meaningful question. Right? But of course in a homogeneous universe, you know that you, can, that you, that you must have no borders. Right? Because any borders you might encounter uh, in a homogeneous universe would of course break homogeneity. Okay? So in other words, um, homogeneity requires us to assume that we can shift this backward light cone here to the left and to the right as we like. So what does this mean for everything else that we can observe in cosmology? Well, for example, if you want to observe cosmological events at a certain, um, at a certain instant of time, for example, the release of the cosmic microwave background, as we, as we will see later, right, then uh, what we see is the cut, right, the intersection. Let's cut a little higher so you can see it. Uh, the intersection of this backward light cone, this deformed backward light cone, with a plane through this diagram at a certain instant of time. Right. So in this pseudo 3D representation here, if you cut here through this backward light cone, you see a circle. Right? This circle, of course, in three dimensions would correspond to a sphere. That is the sphere that we see the, the cosmic microwave background on. And if we would, fo would f uh, move forward in time, then of course the backward light cone would start here. And the intersection with a fixed time would change. In other words, um, the cosmic microwave background as we see it now, does of course change with time, just we see different intersections of our backward light cone with this, with this plane. However, it takes a little bit of patience. Right? So you would have to observe the cosmic microwave background for a rather extended period, much longer than the usual PhD, um, in order to, to, um, to see changes here. All right, but keep this very important picture in mind, right? This blue thing is all we can see of our universe, okay? has a humbling effect on a cosmologist. Anyway, all right. Um, so the only freedom that is left for our cosmological model is that spatial hypersurfaces can either expand or shrink. Now, of course, observations will have to tell us whether it does expand or shrink. Um, nonetheless, if it expands, it leads to cosmological redshift. If it shrinks, it leads to cosmological blue shift. What does this mean? Suppose, I think I have a diagram for that. No, I don't. Uh, let's go back. Suppose you observe a galaxy at this position. 
then this means that the world line of the galaxy must go through this backward light cone at this point. And then, of course, its light signal will travel along our backward light cone towards us. As it propagates, the universe expands. At the same time, the wavelength of the light traveling from that galaxy to us will be stretched by, by the same amount as space itself is going to be stretched. Okay? So in other words, um, in other words, um, the emitted frequency related by the observed frequency of the light, which is of course the inverse in wavelengths, right? It's the, the ratio of the observed wavelength divided by the emitted wavelength, um, is just given by the radius uh, by, by the ratio of scale factors. Right? The scale factors for the spatial part of the metric um, at the emission time divided by the observation time. So in other words, if the universe expands by a factor of two, then A at the emission time is half the scale factor at the observation time. And this means that the wavelengths uh, are stretched by a factor of two. Right? To make the whole notion a bit more, uh, a bit more complicated, um, we introduce, or in co cosmology or in, in astronomy, you introduce a redshift z, which is related to the scale factor ratio in this way. Right, so, if the wavelength doubles, the redshift is one. Okay, and so on. All right. Now, the measurements of redshifts of galaxies tell us that the universe is expanding. Right. So we know that nowadays the scale factor of the universe increases. Okay. All right. Now, suppose you believe this metric. Right. Suppose you believe that the assumptions leading to this particular form of the metric are in fact meaningful. Then we can proceed and say, all right, what, does Einstein, what, what do Einstein's field equations now say about the possible evolution of that metric? In other words, you will have to take the, the metric as we have constructed it now and have to insert this into Einstein's field equations. Again, let me say that the order of the arguments is very important. Right? So far, we have specified in no way what theory of gravity we are going to use. Right? We have not specified general relativity yet. Now is the time that we are doing that. Okay? So, so far we have only assumed that we have a metric theory of gravity. In other words, a theory of gravity that describes gravity as a geometrical effect. So far we have only constructed a specific form, the metric. Now, as we ask for the exact dynamics of the metric, the exact form of the, of the theory matters. Before, it didn't. So not even for the statement of on, on redshift, this th the exact theory of, of gravity mattered. Right? We know that any metric theory of gravity will lead to redshift or blue shift if it's ex expanding or shrinking. Okay? The way how this depends on the matter-energy content of the space-time and so on, that's, that's controlled by the, by the field equations. Right, but only now they come into the game. All right, so what happens? Okay, we insert the metric into Einstein's field equations. That's a tedious thing to do um, because you have to calculate all the second order derivatives of the Christopher symbols of the metric and so on, blah, blah. Uh, but then once you have done this, you arrive at these two equations here. They are called Friedman's equations, um, according to the uh, Russian mathematician Alexander Friedman, who first derived them in the 1920s. All right, what are the parameters occurring here? Well, of course, A, you already know, that's the, the relative time change squared of the, of the scale factor, the geometrical scale factor of the, of the hypersurfaces. That's the matter energy density, right? In other words, what does, what does, what does rho include? It includes all forms of energy. Right? It's the matter density corresponding to all forms of energy. In other words, 
rho, for example, contains the energy density in the photons or in the neutrinos or whatever you may find. Okay? That's the curvature parameter we already had. That's the cosmological constant. Now, at this point, I should already say, Einstein, of course, first published his uh, field equations without the cosmological constant. Um, that was on November 18, 1915. November 25, sorry. November 18, he had another paper which, which arrived at a different form of field equations. Uh, all right. November 25, 1915. Um, at that time, he had not included the cosmological term yet. This, this came into the theory in 1917 with a paper where Einstein, interestingly, started with the Poisson equation of Newtonian physics and said we have a problem there, even in Newtonian cosmology, right? because the Poisson equation, the solutions of the Poisson equations are characterized by the, f by the boundary conditions. But in a homogeneous and isotropic universe, we, you don't have a boundary. So what do you do? And he first introduced the cosmological term into Newtonian theory, as an just additional term in the, in the Poisson equation there, and then said, let's see if we can do the same in general relativity. That's how it happened. Right? So you see, this is by no means controlled by general relativity or something like that. Right? So you need something like a cosmological constant, um, even if you wanted to do Newtonian cosmology. All right, it is being said that Einstein later claimed that this was the greatest blunder he ever did. Well, there is no proof for that statement in any of Einstein's scriptures, right? not in his letters, not in his papers. The only quote of this statement uh, goes back to um, George Gamow, which mentioned this in his autobiography, my word line it's called. So there is no proof at all that, that Einstein really said this. There's also no reason to believe this, right? Because uh, when Einstein found that, or when, when empirical evidence mounted that the universe is in fact expanding, Einstein said, well, then we don't seem to need the cos cosmological term anymore. Nowadays we do. Right? We do believe that we do need um, the cosmological term, but we will get to that in the course of this week. All right, fine. So let's leave the cosmological term in it, because it's not at all a, bl a blunder. Uh, and then in the second equation, you have one additional parameter. It's the pressure P um, of, uh, of the cosmic matter content, or matter energy content. Right? And we'll, we will desperately need this later on. All right, these are the two Friedman equations. Um, a Belgian priest called Georges Lemaitre derived them independently. Nonetheless, they are called Friedman equations. Uh, if you combine the two, you can show that they are equivalent to. So, these two equations are equivalent to one of these equations and this one. This one is very important. I get to that. So, you could either pick this and that or this and that, but since this is first order in, t in, in, in time, we take that, okay? So this is often also called uh, the Friedman equations, right? Even though you have two of them. By the way, why do you have two of them? Why do Einstein's field equations have to end with two equations? Right? Because you can split Einstein's field equations into a time component and a spatial component. Spatial components, of course, must all be equal if you insist on isotropy and homogeneity. So there's a space component and one time component. Therefore, you have to end up with two equations. These are these two. But they are equivalent to, let's, sa let's, sa let's say, this one and that one. Now, what is this? This is the first law of thermodynamics. Look what it says. Rho c squared is the energy density. Times a cubed is energy density times volume. So what is this? Well, this is the U, right? the change of internal energy. Um, what is this? Well, that's just P times dA cubed times dT. So this is the volume. So here's PdV. Right? So what it says is the U plus PdV equals zero. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, what about the heat? I mean, 
in this form, the first law of thermodynamics is incomplete, right? Why can heat flows not occur here? Entropy conservation? No. What was that? A uh, not really. Isotropy. Isotropy is the point, right? Because any heat flow would define direction. Directions are forbidden. No heat flows. <laughs> All right. So that is the first law of thermodynamics specialized to this situation. But haven't you heard before that there is no such thing as energy conservation as in general relativity? And there is no, no such thing. Right? There's only a local version of energy momentum conservation in general relativity. So why do we get global energy conservation now? The only reason is that we have a global time direction. And this is the consequence of our symmetries that we have assumed. Right? So if we had not assumed this very high degree of symmetry, we would not have a unique time direction and then energy conservation in this global form would never, would never hold. Right? So again, this, um, this form of energy conservation uh, is a consequence of the symmetry assumption that we have made. All right. Yeah. You see, I'm spending a lot, a lot of time on the, on the foundations of the theory. I'm doing this on purpose <laughs> because it's very important to keep in mind what we put in, what the consequences are, and what we might release afterwards, right, if we search for alternatives. Okay? So, but let me let me say one word. Sorry, one German word. Uh, <laughs> on the relation to Newtonian theory. Right? Because in fact it is possible to derive the Friedman equations perfectly from Newtonian theory if you are willing to add two things. The reason is the following. Um, suppose you really have a homogeneous and isotropic universe. Um, then you can define one particular point as the origin at your choice. The consequence of homogeneity. So let's fix this point where that sphere is centered on. Right? Isotropy tells you that within that sphere, first of all, there must be no preferred direction. Second, density cannot change. Right? Then, Newton's theorem tells you that the surroundings of that sphere must be spherically symmetric. In other words, it cannot have a gravitational feedback on the sphere itself. In other words, I can take out that sphere and study its dynamics irrespective of its surroundings. If you do that, right, if you just sit with a test mass on the boundary of that sphere and you analyze the Newtonian equation of motion of that thing, of that test mass, at the boundary of that sphere, you arrive at Friedman's equations if you take into account that pressure must act as a source of gravity, right, but this is already contained in special relativity. And special relativity tells you that any form of energy must be equivalent to a form of matter. But pressure is energy density. In other words, where you have pressure, you must have the additional effective mass of that pressure in addition uh, to, the, to the actual matter density as a source of gravity. So that's the trick I've played here. In addition to the density, you add 3p divided by c square, 3p because 3p is the trace of the, um, of the spatial part of the energy momentum tensor. Right? So in other words, you have to take into account that pressure is a form of energy density, therefore pressure must act as a source of gravity. And if you add that, um, then you end up with this equation here, if you integrate it once, um, where what we call the curvature before now enters as the integration constant. Okay. The cosmological constant is missing, but as I said before, Einstein himself introduced the cosmological constant into Newtonian physics in the first place. Right, so if he did that, then you would get the full set of the Einstein uh, of the of the Friedman equations also from Newtonian theory. 
And there is a very good reason for doing so, as I have tried to explain. Right? Because first of all, homogeneity tells you that you can pick out any point in space and see this as representative. Isotropy tells you that the surroundings of any sphere that you might cut out um, of the space-time then must not um, act as a source of gravity on that sphere. Right? Um, and then, also because of isotropy, you can of course choose that sphere as small as you want. So that Newtonian physics will still be applicable. Okay. All right. This is what I wanted to tell you about the foundations of the cosmological standard model. Um, as you've seen, we require three ingredients and no more than that. First is general relativity. Second is isotropy with all the caveats that we added on the term isotropy. Right? And uh, third was homogeneity. So what have we done? We have used general relativity under three, uh, sorry, under two symmetry assumptions. Right? Then we have seen that if you only assume the symmetry and not even the field equations, you already can fix the, um, the shape of the metric. And you can fix the form of the metric even way before you know anything about the dynamics of the metric. And you arrive at the conclusion that there must be something like gravitational redshift or blue shift way before you fix the, the field equations. And then the field equations only do one thing for you, they give you the Friedman equations. Right? And we've seen that um, ac because of our symmetry assumptions, um, we can even speak of global uh, energy conservation here. That's it. Now, as you will see, all the rest I'm going to tell you are consequences of these two assumptions plus general relativity. So this also means that if you want to avoid any of the conclusions we are going to draw for the rest of the week, you will have to, th to give up one of the three assumptions we have made. Can you give up isotropy? Essentially no, right? because we are observing that. Can you give up homogeneity? Possibly yes. Uh, I'll say more about this. Can you give up general relativity? Of course. But go ahead and find a similarly successful theory. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, <laughs> I, I, I promise we are going to speed up. <laughs> but I think it is necessary to, to go through these, through these concepts uh, in, in, in close detail. Do you have any questions so far? Chapter one. So as you see, we have 12 chapters. We have one hour for chapter one. So this, yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, all right, if you don't have any questions, we move on. Now we have to relate what we have learned so far to uh, parameters that we might be able to measure, right, or other quantities that we might be able to measure. So this is now, this is now the next important step. So parameters age and distance is the headline for the whole chapter. Forms of matter, it's the next one, as you will see, cosmologists distinguish only between two forms of matter, those with and those without pressure. You see how simple-minded cosmologists are, it's very easy to understand. Uh, all right, then we will have to speak about the parameters typically entering the cosmological standard model. Then we will have to, to, to say a few words about age, and age of the universe and distances in the universe and also about the concept of horizons. All right, which is a different concept from the horizons you have around a black hole, for example, but we are coming to that. All right, so forms of matter. Hmm. As I said, cosmologists only distinguish between those forms of matter that have no pressure and those that have some pressure. Now, what does this mean? This is not uh, a thermal pressure that you would compare to, uh, let's say, an energy density KBT or something like this. What is meant here is you have to see the energy content represented by the pressure in comparison to the energy content of space-time represented by the, m by the rest mass density. In other words, what you have to compare is the rest energy density rho c square to the pressure. 
Now for ordinary matter, if you think about the ideal gas equation of state, for example, the pressure would be uh, essentially given by KBT, right? very, very, very much smaller than the rest energy density. So in view of cosmology, we just say, all right, for ordinary matter, also called dust in cosmology, or internal relativity in the on the whole, we set the pressure to zero, right, with the justification that then the thermal energy content of the matter is very much smaller than the rest energy content. In other words, this is non-relativistic matter. All right, if the matter becomes relativistic, then cosmologists call it radiation. So, for example, there is proton radiation in the very early universe. Okay, for radiation, as you know, the pressure of any fermionic or bosonic relativistic quantum field is rho c squared divided by 3. Right? So, in other words, for radiation, in this sense, we assume that the pressure is just rho c squared divided by 3. All right, now take these two assumptions, either pressure equals zero or pressure equals rho c squared divided by 3 and insert this into the energy conservation equation, the first law of thermodynamics in the form that we had it in. Right, then you will see that this implies, first of all, for non-relativistic matter, that the density simply changes like scale factor of the minus third power. Well, what else should it do? Right? This is just a geometrical dilution of matter as space expands. However, for radiation, you see that the density scales like scale factor of the minus fourth power. Also a very important realization for um, the thermal history of the universe. Right? Why does it scale with a to the minus four rather than a to the minus three? Well, there's the geometrical dilution of all of the particles, plus there's the loss of energy of the individual particles by redshift. And right? if you think of photons, first of all, you make the photons more dilute by a factor of a to the minus three, but then you also stretch their wavelengths, which implies an energy loss by another factor of a. And so therefore, the energy density of radiation falls like a to the minus four rather than a to the minus three. Now, if you think of energy conservation, remember, we have derived these scalings from the first law of th thermodynamics. Right, so there's no contradiction with um, energy conservation here because we derive these results from the, energy uh, from the law of energy conservation. All right, that's the first thing to realize, right? There are two different forms of matter, relativistic and non-relativistic ones, and they scale with the scale factor in a different way, yes? Sorry, uh, where does the energy go? Into the expansion. <laughs> so you have essentially an increase in, in um, relative potential energy even though potential energy is a difficult concept for general relativity. Mm. So it's very loose speaking, but that's where it goes. All right, so that's that. Now, let's speak about the Hubble parameter or the Hubble function. These are two different things. But first of all, who is Hubble? Hubble is Edwin Powell Hubble, right, an astronomer who for the first time uh, was able to measure or to empirically find that there is evidence for the universe to expand. Interestingly, he didn't care at all. Right, I'm coming to that later. Nonetheless, what we call now the Hubble function is just another word for the relative change of the scale factor. It's a dot over a. But this, of course, depends on time, and therefore it doesn't make sense, even for a cosmologist, to call that function a constant. Uh, the constant is the Hubble function evaluated today. Okay. So as you see, it has the dimension of one over time. Nonetheless, the way how cosmologists usually phrase this is not as with a unit one over time, but with a unit length over length times time. <laughs> or in other words, velocity over distance. Right? And one very conventional way of, of writing this is a hundred small h. h now is a dimensionless number. Kilometers per second per megaparsec. In other words, this tells you by how many kilometers per second the um, 
the recession velocity of the galaxies will increase as the distance of the galaxies increases by a megaparsec. Now what does that little age mean? The little age was a trash bin for our ignorance. Right? So when I was in your position um, as a PhD student, age was known to be somewhere between 0.5 and 1. That was what we call precision cosmology at these days. Very interesting. So in other words, we used to quantify our ignorance by saying, OK, there's a little age. We don't quite know what that is. Uh, it should be somewhere, somewhere between 0.5 and 1, but we don't really know. Aha. Nowadays, we know age 2 better than a percent. This allows two conclusions on myself, uh, which I won't detail any further. Uh, <laughs> all right. So nowadays, we know that the little age is um, yeah, about 0.7. The measurement, or this measurement, tells you that the Hubble constant, so the value today, is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 18 times little h. So think of times 0.7 uh, there. So it's about 2 times 10 to the minus 18 per second. Aha, what does this mean? Well, every length scale changes by a factor of 2 times 10 to the minus 18 per second. In other words, if you wait for a year, a meter will grow by the length of a hydrogen atom. Roughly. <laughs> Aha. That's probably too slow for you to notice. Uh, you can't notice because this is the, ex the free expansion of space. But of course, you are bound by forces, right? Fortunately, in your case, also in mine, it's electromagnetic forces, right? Essentially, van der Waals forces that keep you together. They are, of course, very much stronger than any force you could associate with the cosmic expansion. So you don't grow over time, <laughs> not even by a hydrogen atom per meter. I can assure you that over time you rather shrink. Uh, neither, neither does the Earth grow, of course, because it's also held together by electromagnetic forces. Neither does everything grow, neither does anything grow that is bound by gravity, for example. Right? Because ordinary gravity, which is controlled by the Newtonian uh, gravitational constant, is also kept together against uh, the cosmological expansion. Right? So, for example, our Milky Way doesn't grow either. The local group of galaxies doesn't grow either. Right? Only if you consider the separation of objects which are not gravitationally bound to each other, in other words, which have no negative potential energy with respect to each other, then their distance is going to grow with, the, um, with that rate here. That's very important to realize because I'm, I'm often being asked, well, uh, so when will I have grown by 10 centimeters? Well, uh, unfortunately, never. All right. Then, the Hubble function or the Hubble constant, one of both, allows us to define a critical density. Because this combination of quantities, 3h squared divided by 8 pi g, uh, has the di dimension of a density. And you can easily find this out if you say, okay, the Hubble function or the Hubble constant are just one over time. All right. This is a very important parameter for scaling energy or matter densities in the universe with. The value of the critical density can be easily evaluated by this number, right? 3 h0 squared divided by 8 pi g. If you just insert the value for h0 that we had before, you find that this is 1.9 times 10 to the minus 29 h square g cubic uh, per cubic centimeter. So h square, of course, is about a factor of 0.5 right, because h is about a factor of 0.7. Um, so this means this corresponds to, a, to the density, a mean critical density of one proton in five cubic meters. This is very much more dilute than any high vacuum you can produce on Earth. Nonetheless, this is a high density for cosmology. Okay, but this sets an important scale uh, for, the, uh, for the energy or mass density in the universe. 
All right, now with this density parameter, you can convert everything else to dimensionless quantities. For example, right, you take any density that might occur in your Friedman equations. Right, this could be a radiation density, it could be a matter density, density of anything else. Um, you scale this with a critical density, you get a dimensionless parameter, and those are typically called, uh, or typically uh, abbreviated by this omega, these omega parameters. Right. If omega gets a subscript zero, what people usually mean, by no means all the time, um, what people usually mean is that same ratio today, this changes over time. If you do this, a similar thing with a cosmological constant, you can assign a uh, can assign a density parameter, dimensionless density parameter to the cosmological constant as well, which of course, only to confuse you, um, is not at all constant over time. Right? So what people usually in the literature call the cosmological constant, is the omega lambda, is not at all a constant. What is constant is the capital lambda. Okay, but since you relate this to, a, t to a, a function which changes over time, the omega parameter and density parameter associated with the cosmological constant is not at all constant. So don't get confused by that. Now, the cosmological constant itself must have, must have dimension 1 over length scale squared. So you see, if you multiply this with the speed of light squared and divide by an inverse time scale squared, like the Hubble constant, you get a dimensionless number. All right. Now, if you insert all that into the Friedman equation, right, the one of the two that we have left now, why do we only have one left? Because we have used the second law of thermodynamics already. Right? We use the second law of thermodynamics to derive the scalings for the energy densities or for the ma matter densities. So now we, we do in fact only have one of the Friedman equations left and then of course we take the one that is first order in time. All right, now it looks like this and you see a very important thing. First of all, on the left hand side we have the Hubble function. Okay, on the right hand side we have the Hubble constant both squared. But now, uh, there's something in these square brackets which we call the expansion function, sometimes. It has a radiation density in it. It scales like a to the minus four. It has a matter density inside. Well, this of course now refers to non-relativistic matter only, because it scales like a to the minus three. This reflects what the, the, the expansion behaviors that we, that we have been talking about before. Then we have the cosmological constant density parameter, which does not change with the scale factor at all. And then we have a contribution that scales with the spatial curvature. Yeah. So are you assuming that the radiation sector and matter sector don't interact with each other? And no. No, if you, if you would take into account, for example, that part of what is now matter in the early universe behaved as radiation because it was, it was relativistic, then you would have to switch over from here to there. Right? So for now I'm assuming that they are separate, spe th th they are separate species and, and stay that. But of course if I go back to the very early universe, I would have to take into account that what is now non-relativistic matter may have been relativistic in the in the early universe. Right, what I mean is that the scaling of a to the minus 4 and a to the minus 3 are so, I mean, separately. No, you don't need to. You don't need to. These are, these are constants. Right? These are the, the, the present day, the present day values of these densities. So you can now solve one equation and you have their behavior for all times. Scaling of a to the minus four is obtained by solving uh, assuming that only there is radiation. Well no, we know that we know from the energy conservation equation, right? 
how matter or radiation <coughs> would scale with time or with, with a scale factor. Ah, here we, you would keep the species separate. You are assuming that they don't interact with each other? That at least due to their interaction, their behavior doesn't change significantly. That's what we assume. This may change, and in that case, you would have to, to couple the species together, right, by a common pressure term, for example, and then solve the equation together. But essentially, this never happens for a reason that we are going to go into. All right, so if I return to this form of the Friedman equation now, um, it tells you that there typically occur these four terms in the Friedman equation which control the behavior of the universe. No more than that. Right? But what it also tells you is, suppose you start with a certain value of the radiation density parameter today. And this may be completely subdominant today, but as it scales like a to the minus 4 and a becomes smaller as we go back in time, right, the radiation density part will grow much more rapidly than the matter density part. Right, so as you go back in time, those part, uh, thi this part will grow the fastest, then this, then this, and then that. Okay. So depending on the mixture of, of things, of, of m matter energy contributions today, the behavior of the universe in the past may have been completely different than it is now. That's important to realize. Let's have I'm skipping forward, as you see, but let's have a look at this diagram right away. Uh, this is how the different contributions of I'm coming to that uh, how different contributions of radiation or matter will change over time. This is the present. This is the contribution by the cosmological constant. This is the contribution by matter. And the contribution by radiation you don't even see. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 5 today. Now, as you go back in time, cosmological constant drops, matter grows, and radiation catches up. Now, if you are very early in the evolution of the universe, very early in time, only radiation dominates the evolution. Yeah, you had a question. Here we go. You were defining all those constants to find uh, the scale factor today to be one, uh, but you said that you could change the that like the scaling of a to make k uh, one minus one or zero. So can you still do that when you're doing uh, like we, can you define a to be one today and then also define k to be plus minus one or zero? Or do you have to? That's independent. That's independent. Setting a to one is just a choice of 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 um, uh, it's just a conventional choice. It just says we are referring all lengths in the universe to their value today. Okay. Right? Curvature is a different matter. But let's get to that r r right away. Um, as you see, it has the Hubble function on the left-hand side, the Hubble constant on the right-hand side. But of course, at the present, the two have to agree by definition. Right? So at the present, when we said a to 1, the term in, um, in angular brackets must be 1. Right, which we can only achieve if we set k in this way. Right, so k is set by the difference of 1 and the sum of all the density parameters today. Okay, uh, so this allows us to assign a density parameter also to the curvature. Right. And then you arrive at this form of the Friedman equation understanding that of these four parameters that are now in the expansion function, right, in the square brackets here, only three are independent, right, because once you know three of them, the curvature is set. Okay. 
All right. Good. Now let's come back to the scaling of the uh, of the different types of matter, of relativistic matter and non-relativistic matter. So today we know that radiation density is completely subdominant. Right? I will show you later how we measure that. But today the radiation density parameter is on the order of 10 to the minus 5 and the matter density parameter is on the order of 0.3. And so radiation is completely subdominant. But this tells you immediately that um, if you go back in time such that the scale factor becomes smaller than this value here, radiation density will dominate. This is very important to realize. We will need this later, for in particular when we talk about primordial nucleosynthesis, right, the theory of the, of the formation of the, of the lightest elements. All right. So there is a scale factor which we call scale uh, um, A equality, right? the scale factor at matter radiation density equality, before which radiation controlled, radiation completely controlled the expansion history of the universe. This sets a very important instant of time, as we will see later, right? one we can directly observe today. Right? And it's very important for us that uh, the inverse value of this of this uh, scale factor here scales directly proportional to the matter density parameter. And we'll see later what, what this is important for. All right, now, if you go back to the definition of the density parameters, right, density divided by the critical density, you take into account that the critical density depends on time or on scale factor. You can derive formulae for the scaling of the density and cosmological constant density parameters with the scale factor A and you just see the formulae there. There's no, no point in, in memorizing them, of course, um, but this tells you how the density parameters will change over time um, and this is the corresponding figure. Right. Of course, I haven't, tell, uh, I haven't told you anything about how you measure the density parameters now. Right. But we will have to get to that. Uh, one question yeah. Answering the plot, <coughs> shouldn't those three curves add up to one? They do. But the blue curve is divided to ten to the minus six. Yeah. If you add up the blue curve, which is zero today. No, no. Uh, at the very other end. At, at this end. Yeah. Ah. Okay. If you go further, okay. it will ultimately end up <laughs> at, at one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you're right. You're right. If these density parameters add up to one at any instant in time, they will do so for all other instances as well. Right? Completely right. Figure looks misleading. I agree. Um, all right. This is also important to realize here. Okay. There are five minutes left for these one and a half hours. Is this assuming uh, the was yes. Where was the curvature? Did, that, did you assume flat uh, zero curvature? <coughs> this is correct. This is correct, but this already implies that the curvature must be zero. Right? All right. Now, this is for you to memorize. Right, there will be a test tomorrow. <laughs> These parameters have mainly been obtained with a data set that was produced by the Planck satellite that observed the cosmic microwave background with extreme detail. We are coming to that probably on Thursday. Nonetheless, right, let me show you these parameters now for two reasons. First of all, so you have an impression of their, of their, their size, right? what is their order of magnitude. Second, because of the accuracy, right? As I told you before, when I was in your place, the Hubble constant was known to about 100% uncertainty. <laughs> All right, this has changed. Hubble constant, well, this is what Planck believes the Hubble constant is. Unfortunately, that's not Max Planck, right? You can't blame him. Uh, unfortunately, other people think otherwise. That's very interesting. Other people think that little age is 0.72. That's awkward. 
that's awkward because the claimed accuracy is below a percent now. But those two don't agree. That's a very interesting indication of something we don't know. Anyway, um, dark matter density, well, of course, we will have to speak about the notion of dark matter and where it comes from, what it means, and so on later. Dark matter density 0.26. Aha, uh -huh. so 26% of the critical density is contributed by dark matter, whatever it may be. Cosmological constant, 0.68. Aha, uh -huh. nobody knows why the two numbers should roughly be equal. By a factor of two, things are equal in cosmology. I think you have to accept that. Uh, all right, baryon density. Well, again, baryons are everything that interacts electromagnetically in cosmology. I'm sorry for this misuse of, no of, of, of terminology, but anyway. Uh, baryon density, so that's all we know, just below 5%. Radiation density, well, that's what I said before, right, on the order of 10 to the minus 5. Okay, Hubble time, what is that? Well, as I said before, the Hubble constant is 1 over time. So if you turn this around, you get a time scale. 14.6 giga years. A very important number. Why? We will speak about this tomorrow. But um, what it means is that this sets an upper times, an upper length, sorry. <laughs> it sets an upper limit to the amount of time we had in cosmology so far. Nothing in the universe that we can observe should be older than that. Is that true? That's interesting to find out. We'll see tomorrow. So if you find somebody who is older than 14.6 giga years, beware. Beware. In fact, the age of the universe is a little bit less than that. This comes from the fact that um, the, uh, the dynamics of the universe didn't change linearly, but non-linearly over time. So therefore, the age, well, the scale for the age of the universe is, mm, well, 13.8 giga years. Right? Nothing should be older than that. Hmm. This was a massive problem for early cosmology, by the way. Okay. Matter radiation equ equality. Well, this occurred when the density, oh sorry, when the scale factor was 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4. In other words, when every meter, when every meter was shrunk to about 0.3 millimeters. When the universe had, uh, when you shrink the universe such that, not you personally, but in your imagination, think that you, that you shrink each meter in the universe down to 0.3 millimeters, then the radiation density will overtake. Okay, this corresponds to a redshift of about th uh, 3,700. Okay, optical depth. We get to that fluctuation amplitude also. Um, these are the numbers. The degree of knowledge that is contained in these numbers is extraordinary. Right? The accuracy we can attach to these numbers, we can faithfully attach to these numbers, for me, right, having seen the evolution, is mind-blowing. There are some awkward discrepancies we will talk about. Um, what it also means is that there is essentially no observation in the universe anymore that grossly contradicts these numbers. And let me therefore finish this first lecture with the following statement. Um, we have started with a, with, a, with a most simple cosmological model we can construct. <coughs> right? In other words, we have taken general relativity, what else, uh, and used two symmetry assumptions and perhaps the two... The bell is ringing, I should stop. Nonetheless, um, we use the two symmetry assumptions that appear as the, the most straightforward ones we can make. Right? So we make the simplest model of the universe. And when, when Alexander Friedman made this for the first time, he writes in his paper, right, I'm a mathematician, I'm allowed to do this. What this has to do with physics, I, I don't know and I don't care. Approximately. Right? Uh, all right, so what on earth should a model like this have to do with our universe? It's the simplest model we could think of. And nonetheless, what we find is that this simplest model does not show any major contradiction to all observational data that we nowadays have. 
But these observational data contain um, observations from the epoch of nuclear primordial nuclear synthesis between two and three minutes after the Big Bang, and now about 14 billion years after the Big Bang. In other words, this is also a sequence of time. Why it is that the simplest model agrees to this exquisite degree with our observations, we don't know. Right? But this, in my view, really comes close to a miracle. And then, of course, you can still think of general relativity to be essentially the simplest metric theory of gravity. And if you want, I explain this to you over a beer or so. Um, but let's stop for now. Thank you. <coughs>